you have a very interesting story, um, humble beginnings, and we'll kind of try to speed through some of it and get to the meat and potatoes so that people can really, really get something out of what you have to say today, because I know you have some really profound things to share. Um, but so can you talk a little bit about kind of where you were from, being an immigrant, immigrant and coming into America and making a name for yourself? Sure. So um, it started back in 2006, which was about three years after the, uh, you know, the invasion on Iraq. Um, we, we, I mean, it was a, a uh, hard time. It was pretty much war 24-7 in the streets. Um, cars blowing up, uh, you know, people's body remains on the streets. And uh, that's when my father wow. decided that it's time for us to, to get the hell out of Iraq. Because up until then, he was uh, still optimistic that things are going to turn around. Uh, but unfortunately, it got worse. Mm. And so he sent us off. Uh, we came to America. I was 16 years old. Uh, was actually arrived to America on 06, 06, 06. Whoa. Uh, yeah, that was kind of strange. Um, I, had, I knew zero English. I, um, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot of relatives here. We first went to Detroit, Michigan. Um, we stayed there for one year, and then from there we moved to San Diego, okay. uh, California in 2007, and uh, just a year and a half ago actually moved to, um, to Miami. But, um, you know, when I first started, some of the very first struggles was needing to learn how to speak English, um, needing to, uh, you know, mesh with a new culture that mm -hmm. I've never, you know, Iraq being in the complete eastern side of the world, now I'm, I'm on the mo one of the most developed Western worlds, yeah. and uh, and I need to learn how that works. Um, start making new friends, right. and and by the time I started making some friends in Detroit, my mom was like, "Well, now we got to go to California." Mm -hmm. So now coming to California, you know, learning again, still learning English, still making my my place in in school, and I had this funny long hair, and I was like <laughs> a skinny guy, and. I used to get, you know, I used to get made fun of a lot in high school. So it wasn't, it wasn't the prettiest time, yeah, but yeah. I made through it. So. And, and I want to kind of unpack that a little bit because I think, I think that's huge, what you just kind of said. Looking at what you've come from, seeing, you know, people in different circumstances in the face of really insurmountable odds, and then coming here and trying to and pursuing the American dream. Can you kind of unpack that a little bit about seeing that, like coming from this certain level of poverty, into like something totally, totally different. Yeah, so um, my father owned the second largest factory of clothing in Iraq. So in the 80s, early 90s, he was worth tens of millions of dollars. Mm. But in 91, uh, there was a Gulf War in Iraq and what happened was the Iraqi dinar used to be, one dinar used to equal $3. Overnight, it went to one dollar equaling 1,200 dinars. Wow. So my dad literally went from a multimillionaire to completely broke. His businesses went out of business. So as I was growing up, looking mm. from outside in, we looked wealthy because my dad had properties. We had a very nice home, mm -hmm. but he didn't have a cash flowing business. So for the first like 10, 12 years of my life, we were living like hand to mouth. You mm. know, he couldn't sell anything because nothing was worth anything anymore. And then he was too proud to just like liquidate. Yeah. Uh, any business he tried to do, he just kind of couldn't, he couldn't evolve really. Yeah. And, um, and so that was very difficult there. But then coming to the U.S. and wanting to kind of like live the life here, I remember the very first day I woke up after we had made it to Detroit. It was me and my brother. My mother was already in America. I woke up in the morning and I could hear people speaking English. Okay. And it was so weird. It was as if I was in a movie, you know, because we watched, yeah. you know, American movies as we, sure. as we grew up. Sure. I looked over the, the bed outside the window and I see it's like this, this like from a, the, the most perfect like setting. Yeah. It's this subdivision with like houses, you know, perfectly mowed lawn. There's a, a dad pushing his daughter on a bike. Wow. And it's, a, I think it was a Sunday or something like that. I can't remember exactly. And that's when I realized that, holy shit, I'm in America. Yeah. You know? And I remember a few days later, my brother and I were like walking down the street and we were still just taking everything in. It was just mm -hmm. so overwhelming. And I stood in the middle of the street. It was like, I don't know where we were. I think we were at the supermarket called Myers or something in Detroit. And I stepped outside in the parking lot and I looked up to the sky and I went like this and I said, freedom, you know, that was the, one of the first English words that I like knew how to say, you know, and it was the funniest thing. But I felt a sense of freedom. I felt mm. now there were opportunities 
that I could actually do. Because in Iraq, you couldn't really think like that. You couldn't mm. think five, ten years from now. You're thinking, you know, this militia that's fighting with, with the American uh, uh, troops, they're about to fire a missile out of my, you know, literally in front of my house. Mm -hmm. Is that missile going to fly this way or is it going to fly back and fall into my, you know, my, my living room? Wow. So that was like the day to day. There's no electricity. Until now, my brother lives in Iraq. I talk to him sometimes. Yeah. The conversation is like, hey, bro, what's the electricity schedule now? It's like, well, it's four on, two off. It's a little better now, you know? So, God. like, that's what, they, what wow. they're dealing with. And that's why sometimes when I talk with people that have, and even my culture, that I've, you know, that they were born and raised here, I'm like, dude, you have it way easy. Mm. Like, you really need to appreciate what you have. Because trust me, other parts of the world, that's not the kind of life they're living, right. you know? Do you have any stories that you can kind of recollect of, like, maybe a near death or where you actually realize that like an encounter with the militia or anything to that nature yeah i mean a couple a couple things come to mind one of the the one one of them this is like a this is like a little one you know not, nothing big deal um it was about 11 o'clock at night it's me my brother his friends and some of my friends uh outside of my house mm -hmm. 11 o'clock at night there's no electricity so all the guys are like outside lemon playing dominoes and stuff like that using like candles and little torches and stuff like that and um a random car pulls up okay. and there's like seven, eight of us, you know, it's a big group of us. Random car pulls up. Um, they roll down the window. Two of them walk out with guns. Hey guys, we need your cell phones. Immediately they give us their, you know, we give them their phones, our phones. They sit in the car and they bounce. And that's that. And that was like a, a normal day. Wow. Everyone went home like nothing happened. It's like, hey, we're glad no one of us got wow. killed or something in the All process. they wanted was the phones? Just the phones, you know, just a small robbery. That's all it was, wow. just a hold up, you know. Another one, we were uh, one day coming back from um, my dad's work, and we're at the traffic light. Everyone, just like how an ambulance, you know, now when you see it, you, like, go to the side. Sure. It was a, uh, was like a, like a bunch of troops, you know. There was, like, a couple of tanks, literally tanks driving down the street like mm -hmm. it's normal. Mm -hmm. A couple of tanks with a couple of Humvees and stuff like that. So everyone went to the side. They passed us. They probably went about a quarter mile, maybe less, and then a car just went off on the oh side of the road gosh. and you could see the car just flying like maybe 100 200 feet in the in the air and then slams on the ground had we gone after them because we stopped we waited for them yeah. had we gone after them we could have probably been blown mm. away by the by the explosion wow mm. okay so you're in america you're yelling out freedom in the middle of the street um i really am very interested in having a conversation around the business aspect of your family and the business dynamic because your dad kind of was, and you can, you can tell me for sure, but spearheaded the business endeavors for, for your family. Can you guys talk about, or can you talk about the mindset that he had early on and how that um, was a benefit to you and your family? So one of the things that I believe um, inspired me was that I wanted to be like my father. That was the thing for me. You know, growing up, for me, he was, uh, because he was pretty wealthy at the time, mm -hmm. he was, in, like, he had a lot of power. He was a mover. He was mm -hmm. a shaker, you know, and, and, and that inspired me, and I wanted to grow up and be like him. So as I grew up, um, I always wanted to be in business for myself. I always wanted to do something. I didn't know what it was. I just knew that, you know, I was destined for something big. I, I wasn't exactly sure what it was. Mm -hmm. And so... We're four siblings. Um, really, I'm the only one that actually has a business. Um, my sister uh, is a lawyer. Okay. So my mom automatically wanted me to become a doctor when sure. we came to America. Sure. She wanted a lawyer and a doctor in the house so that way she can talk and brag to her sisters and her friends, you know. <laughs> um, and she sold me on the idea, actually. So the very first few years, because uh, I actually was a pretty good student in school. Like, I wasn't okay. one of... Like, I was actually the complete opposite of a troublemaker and a bad boy in high school. Okay. You know? Uh, now, I was a player, but I wasn't a bad boy. Oh, you know? a player, so, <laughs> not a player. Yeah, so, uh, um, but then, you know, I, I, as I was, like, coming out, like, I graduated high school with a 3.4 GPA or something, okay. like a 3.6. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I actually did pretty well. But then, as I went to school, as my mom sold me on the idea that I need to become a doctor, once I got into that, I was like, wait a second, but that's not really what I want. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not passionate about this thing, mm -hmm. you know? And I realized that I'm doing it for my mom more than I'm doing it for myself. Yeah. And I was troubled. Do I make my mom proud and kind of do what she wants? Or 
do I do what I want? And unfortunately, I see a lot of people in that position, and they mm -hmm. chose the, I want to make my parents proud version. Wow, yeah. And then they come back five, ten years later and say, fuck, right. why did I do that? I want to go the other route, mm -hmm. you know? And so, luckily, I didn't make that, you know, I yeah. didn't make that mistake. And although up until like a year ago, two years ago, my mom was like, I know one day you will go to school and become a doctor, you know? <laughs> now she stopped saying it, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, my father definitely spearheaded the inspiration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I want to ask you about that too, because the way that you just worded it right now is you said you wanted to make your father proud. Do you no longer have that endeavor in mind? Or do you feel like you did make your father proud with where you are today? Well, I, I think I've made everyone proud. Uh, because at the end of the day, I think um, our parents want to see us happy and want to see us do good in life, mm -hmm. right? Now, each one has, a, um, each one has a, a definition of what doing good in life is, right? Mm -hmm. Some people is just being a hippie and, and, and just living hand to mouth, but doing things that they enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. um, to some people, it's making billions of dollars. To some people, it's going to Mars, you know? Some people, is being, being a doctor. Some people, is living a, 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 a life of service and giving back to other people. So at the end of the day, our parents only know what they know mm -hmm. because they were raised a certain way. They were raised in a certain society, and society at that time was do this, go to school, get a degree, yeah. get a job, right? That's, that's how they were raised. And so I don't like blame my mom because she wanted me to become a doctor, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then now she sees me happy. She sees that I'm making a difference in the world. She sees that I'm doing things that I'm passionate about. And so at the end of the day, that makes her happy. Yeah. And for some people like your father, it is owning a pizza restaurant. And talking about that dynamic of going into business with family and what that actually costed you in the end. Yeah. So... In 2011, um, so after, after about, it was about 2008, 9, uh, my dad was actually able to liquidate some of his properties. Okay. Up until then, we were cash poor. He was now able to liquidate some of his properties because, again, we owned a couple of houses, he owned a couple of buildings, and like, like downtown Baghdad, like prime oh, locations. Wow. Okay. So, you know, after he liquidated, he was probably worth a couple million dollars. Mm -hmm. And he brought some money to, to America. And he said, you know, let's, let's start a business. And so we went and bought our first business in America in 2011. Mm -hmm. And uh, we worked as a family. It was my dad, my mom, me and my brother. Wow. First time in my life I, I worked that many hours. It was like 83, 84 hours a week working at a pizzeria in front wow. of a pizza oven. Your not early the 20s thing. at this point? I was uh, 21. 21, yeah, okay. Yeah, I had just turned 21. Actually, I think I was 20 turning 21. And... Um, and my dad, my dad was 70-something. My mom was 60-something. Wow. So they weren't young. And they're in there chopping tomatoes and onions in the morning, helping us prep, going shopping, all that stuff. Um, and then my brother and I were running, and then he brought one of his friends. I loved it because wow. we were, it was like a family. You know, mm -hmm. we were all together. But I also hated it because I wanted to go 175 miles an hour, and my brother wanted to go like 23 miles an hour. Okay. You know? And then we butted headed heads a lot. Um, he's older than me. Naturally, everything became under his name. The business became under his name. The sure. account became under his name, all that stuff. So he naturally became the boss. Okay. And I just couldn't take that, you know? And I was like, dude, that's fine. Do whatever you want to do. Let's just like speed up the process. Because yeah. our plan was we're going to buy one place. We're going to buy like three, four other places, create like a, a common theme, and then f start a franchise. Like mm -hmm. that's what my dream was. Okay. And, and it was his idea to buy a pizzeria. And then he just didn't speed up the process though. He had his own ideas. You know, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, I had all the good ideas and he didn't. He had his own good ideas. Yeah. They just didn't mesh with me, right? And the speed that you wanted and, to do. And the speed as well, right? And maybe looking back at it, maybe I was trying to go way too fast because I also try to go way too fast, you know, in, in, in other endeavors and they explode in my face. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes like you got you to gotta slow down to speed up, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure what the right answer is, really. I just know that we didn't, it didn't work out. So I decided to do something else on my own. My dad came and said, hey, here's $200,000. This is your college fund. Do whatever you want to do with it. You wow. can either go to school, become a doctor like your mom wants, or you can start your own business. And I said, fuck that. I'm starting my own business. Instantly? So you, so because I feel like when people just get all of a sudden $200,000 handed yeah. to them, that's what you're thinking? You are already business-minded 
in that sense. You didn't think like, oh, I'm going to splurge it or now I'm going to go do this and this and this with it. You decided I'm going to No, yeah, no, no, no. No, it was I want to start a business. I was 23 at the time, 22 at the time, and I wanted to do something big. You know, and I knew I, I had a bunch of ideas and I want to do something big. Um, and again, it wasn't my money, so I couldn't just go and like right. start, you know, blowing it in places. It wasn't like, hey, man, here's two hundred thousand dollars, go do whatever. You <laughs> no, it was like, go do something with your life, yes. right? And I had a, I had an obligation. It wasn't just like, well, I'm just gonna, well, yeah, I'm probably gonna just uh, like vacation and like retire for a year and then mm -hmm. kind of figure out my thing. You no, know, it was like, I'm obligated. I need to get in to go get a quit ROI and make my dad proud. Mm -hmm. And especially because I had just told my mom that I dropped out of college. Right. And that was a big, like, a big slap in her face. Yeah. And so I needed to make up for that. Right. So I had what no time to waste. What was that conversation like telling um, her? Honestly, for six months, she didn't know. I was, wow. you know, I was taking breaks out of the pizzeria to go to school. Right. But I was like either, you know, hanging out with friends. So, or, wh so what, why did it take you six months to tell her? I don't know. I just, not sure. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I don't know. I just didn't have it in me, you know? Yeah. Um, and then it got to a point where I think it just, it's like, look, this is just ridiculous. I just got to come out and tell her. And, uh, and I remember when I told her, she almost knew. Mm. But it was also just like a blow to her face. And, you know, she didn't take it very well, but it is what yeah. it is we live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, so you have this money. You decide to do what with it ultimately? So I had three business ideas. I wanted to get into the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to... Um, I wanted to start a, because my dad had a clothing factory, okay. so I want to do something in fashion. I even tried to like get a degree in design or something like that, okay. fashion design or something. I don't know what it was. And then, um, and then I wanted to also, the third thing was I wanted to open a spa. Oh. I don't know why. why? Don't ask me. Okay. I wanted to combine um, girls and boys, mm -hmm. uh, also do manicures, pedicures, massages, like do this like, you know, this like spa cold place you go, you have drinks mm -hmm. and all that stuff. For me, it was just everything has to be about fun. Like you got to have a good, good time, you know? Yeah. Even at the clothing place, I don't know what the, the spin was around like having fun, but I knew I wanted to make it fun. Something, yeah. And the hospitality thing was like, look, I'm 21, 22. I'm partying all the time. Mm -hmm. If I can party at a place and make money, right. dude, this is like it, you know? <laughs> so that's why I chose that okay. first. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, I want to fast forward a little bit to talk about Two very important numbers that happened in your mm. life, okay? $150,000 in debt yeah. versus $42.99 in profit. Yes. Talk about those two numbers and what they mean to yeah. you. Yeah. Well, wow, you've done your homework. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, um, $150,000. Fast forward three years, April 28, 2015. It's 5 p.m. It was a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. No, it was a Tuesday. Um, I'm leaving the restaurant to go pick up my girlfriend, who, by the way, now is my wife. This was 2014. Um, I get a call. It's 5 p.m. Mm. That's San Diego, California. I get a call. Hey, boss, the kitchen is on fire. Okay, put it out. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. We're all outside. The fire department is here. It's like, okay. I text my girlfriend. I'm like, hey, I can't make it. I turn around, go back to the restaurant. Five, six fire engines outside. There is smoke coming out of the kitchen. Oh my God. I can't go inside. My landlord, Steve, shows up, which I had been late to pay rent for like three or four months. Okay. It's like, well, business wasn't doing good. You needed a restart, yeah. fresh start. Yeah, yeah. Insurance usual is really good at this stuff. <laughs> I'm like, no, Steve, you don't understand. It's like, what? I'm like, I haven't paid insurance in four months. He's like, to me, what? It's like, I haven't paid insurance in four months. And you could see his face just like light up. Uh, yeah. And I mean, the guy was about to strangle me because he's like this dumbass kid came and rented a place from me. He hasn't been really on time with rent since he started. The last four months he hasn't paid rent. And now, you know, this thing, and, and because to him, it's like, well, my building is burned. Who the hell is going to fix it? Like, mm -hmm. screw this guy. What's going to happen here? Yeah. You know? So I owe the IRS about 40 some thousand dollars in backup taxes. I, I had a bunch of things. I, the business... Six months into that business, and this was what I did with that $200,000. Um, six months into it, I knew that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Mm. But I was too proud to ask people for, for advice. Anyone that provided me advice or tried to, I told them to get the fuck out of my place. Mm. I, um, that's one thing, one bad thing that, that I That was a nice way? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, this was one bad thing that I took from my dad. Wow. He had a big ego. 
big. Mm. And I took that, you know, took that mm -hmm. from him. Uh, fortunately, I was, I was able to dismantle that after that experience. But um, that's where the 150K came from, is um, after Olsa and Don, Steve ended up suing me for the remaining of the, was a five-year lease. I was about two and a half, three years into it. So mm. whatever was left, it was like 5K a month or something like that, times 24 months. Yeah. So he sued me for that. Um, and so I came out of that whole, you know, drama with about $150,000 in debt, wow. two repos on my credit. You know, I couldn't even get a credit card, zero money in the bank, um, nothing. And after the 200K, not only did I lose the 200K, oh. but everything that I had invested after all went in. I used to work 120 hours a week, never made a, a penny out of that place. Whoa. Yeah. Did they ever figure out what happened, what started the fire? So, yes, uh, two months prior to that. Um, my brother decided to shut down the pizzeria because mm -hmm. he wanted to get into real estate. My business wasn't doing good. Mm -hmm. We had a consultant that I finally allowed someone to consult me. He said, hey, bro, what you're doing doesn't work. Clearly, you don't know what the hell you're doing, and you're competing against a restaurant next door, which is killing it. Mm -hmm. Why don't you change your concept to something you know? What do I know? I know how to do pizza. Okay. Mm -hmm. My brother was shutting down. We brought all of his equipment to my restaurant, mm -hmm. revamped it, changed the name, and actually tripled, nearly tripled our sales in 45 days. Whoa. So the restaurant actually finally turned around. Yeah. But 45 days later, it caught on fire. So the reason why we had two double-deck pizza ovens, one of those like big old yeah, like 1960s yeah. ovens, I brought a, a Joe Schmo out of just like a, someone's friend to do yeah. the piping, and one of the pipes had a rust, and it was a rusty pipe, and it was gas pipe. So in the middle of service, there, we used to stack boxes on top of the oven. Oh. So it had, there was a gas leak, the boxes caught on fire, and then just the whole thing Wow. Went. Shame on you, Joe Schmo. <laughs> um, okay, so then this happens. You become more humbled from this experience. Um, you go through a stint of, I'm assuming, depression, sadness. Oh, yeah. All of the that's things. That's where the mustache came from. Okay. But that's another story. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you go through all of the feelings that a normal person would probably endure after coming mm -hmm. through something like that. And then you stumbled upon this remarkable experience of being able to profit $42.99. Can you talk about your introduction into Amazon and how that's changed your life? Yeah, I met a, I saw a friend that I went to, um, me and him took our girlfriends to high school, uh, like snowball or whatever, that party, that mid, mid, um, mid year party is called or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I, I saw him like a few months after my, uh, my restaurant burned down. And during that time, I started driving for Uber because I had, I had owed the last paycheck to a lot of my employees. I didn't have money to, to mm. pay them. And so I knew I needed to pay, pay them because they all lived in the same city and they all were like threatening me every day. Like, bro, right. next time I see you, I'm beating your ass because I need my fucking paycheck. And so I'm like, all right, I got to pay these guys somehow. I started driving for Uber. By the way, I had a suspended license. So I got the Uber under my friend's name and I was driving with a suspended license because I got a DUI. Because I started dry, uh, drinking all the wow. time after the, the, the restaurant. Yeah. And, um, and one day I got caught, got a DUI. Yeah. So I was driving for Uber under his name. And then um, Uber, if you're watching this, please don't sue me. <laughs> this was like seven years ago. <laughs> um, and, then I, um, and then I started dishwashing at Hilton Hotels. Mm. I would go drive for Uber and then go dishwashing or That's vice versa. That's very humbling. Those are two very, very, very humble. You know, the Uber, not so much. You don't think but so? Dish, no, Uber, no. Well, Uber, Uber no, was, not so no. Uber yeah. was actually really cool. Like, okay. I, I actually said, when I was driving for Uber, when my Amazon business started catching up, mm -hmm. I was like, I'll probably never stop driving for Uber. And then until it was like, all right, I'm making yeah. way too much money yeah, here. This yeah. is crazy, you know? Okay. Um, but driving for Uber, people don't realize. It's, if you are, like, if you're making anything less than, whatever, 50 grand a year, mm -hmm. you need to leave that and then go drive for Uber. And it was not even about the flexibility and the money or whatever. I made a contact list this long. I was the Uber driver that never shut up. Okay. Right? I don't know if you could tell. I like to talk a lot, you know? <laughs> I literally would not shut up until someone would either tell me, like, hey, bro, I'm just trying to, like, listen to my music or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Just literally tell me to shut the hell up yeah. without telling me to shut the hell up. <laughs> Otherwise, I would know who they are, where they work, what they do for a living, and probably ask for their phone number, mm -hmm. you know? And I would, like, make contacts, you know? I didn't know how I was going to cash out on that. I just knew, like, I need to make contacts. Sure. And so after I started doing that, I met that friend and was like to me, hey, bro, 
um, I work from home. I, make I asked him, I'm like, hey, man, how have you been? What are you doing? He's like, I work from home. Hmm. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah. He's like, I work from home. I'm like, doing what? He's like, I work online. I'm like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. At the time, I had a Facebook page that I would post like once a year on. Mm -hmm. I, had, I probably had never been on YouTube, never been on social media, never been on anywhere on the internet. Wow. I would literally still like go to Google, print the thing to get directions, you know? Yeah, man, of course. Like not even use like, you know, uh, actual maps. Wow. And so I went, he's like, Google, you know, go to this thing called YouTube. I'm like, yeah. oh, cool. So I get on YouTube and I just start, you know, typing things like how to make money online or from home or something like that. And I get exposed to this insane world that I had never known about. Mm. And I was just mind boggled at what I was seeing. Because here I was investing hundreds of thousands of dollars, working hundreds of hours, making zero money, busting my ass. And these kids are like running around, selling online, making all this money. And I'm like, and that's when the ego, yeah. I mean, you just like grab the knife and like, you know, smash that inside of my ego. Yeah. And I really felt like shit. Wow. You know, because I was like, can you imagine if I had taken that 200K and invested in an online business? Holy shit. Wow. That's what I was thinking. And then the whole what if, what if started coming in and, uh, you know, the anxiety and stuff like that. But something about Amazon FBA. Hmm. I don't know what it was. Something about it just stuck to me. Really? Yeah. Okay. So what was like the first thing that you decided to sell? So it was about Christmas of 2015. Mm -hmm. um, again, I had no car. I wasn't driving. I had no, no, no license. So what I did is I, I found this, this concept called arbitrage. Okay. And that's where, and, and I was doing retail arbitrage. You can do online arbitrage. I was doing retail arbitrage. Retail arbitrage is where you go to like stores and you go to the clearance section like Walmart, TJ Maxx, whatever. And then you buy products there that you can sell them online for a markup. Okay. So I learned that you could do that on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would go to uh, places like Home Goods, um, <laughs> and I would find and and I found and and all we did, me and my girlfriend, would take her mom's car because she had an SUV. Mm -hmm. We'd literally drive all around San Diego, going around scanning things. Yep. People would look at us like we're crazy, you know. And this is 2015. Not right. a whole lot of people really knew about this. Yeah. There wasn't really any online videos about it or any of that. So I would scan things and then try to see if there's a certain markup, and I created my own criteria. Like it needs to make at least $10 extra, it needs to be this way, this whatever, you know, just from things that I watched, things that I experienced. And then it was Christmas, and I found this doll. I forget what it was called. It was, uh, there were two colors. It used to be made in pink and purple. Mm -hmm. The pink one used to sell like three times more than the purple. So I found out that at Home Goods, I can buy it for like, I think it was like eighteen or nineteen dollars, yeah. and I can sell it on Amazon for forty-two ninety-nine. Sometimes thirty-nine, sometimes forty-seven. Just kind of depends. Yeah. The first one I sold was forty-two ninety-nine, and I still remember the first night, first day. I wake up in the morning. The first thing I would do is I would jump on my app, you know, and then check it. I open the app, and then there was a sale, forty-two ninety-nine, and that to me was like making a hundred billion dollars. Yeah. Literally, because to me, up until now, in order for me to make money. I had to go shop for the food. I had to store it, prep for it, cook it, serve it, clean after the customer in order for us to sell a sandwich and a beer for 10 bucks. Where now, I just literally, you know, in that 42 bucks, I probably made like seven, eight dollars in profit times a day. And it just literally started that way, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's when I realized that there is something here. But then I was driving around San Diego going crazy. I would have my sister-in-law who lived in Vegas go around Home Goods and buy all those. And then yeah, yeah. I say sister-in-law. She, she was my girlfriend's sister at the time. Yeah. You know? and, um, and then I realized, okay, there's got to be an, an easier, more scalable concept. And that's when I came across another concept called private label, okay. which is what I do now and what we teach our students. Okay. And yeah. tell us a little bit about that. So that's where you actually find a manufacturer. So for instance, this box here, you go to the actual manufacturer and then you... It's white labeled, right? So the manufacturer that actually produces this, um, you find out that using a certain criteria that this product sells on Amazon for X amount of dollars and it sells X amount of units per day per month. So you can make X amount of profit. Mm -hmm. You get it from the supplier. Usually we try to um, get, we try to buy our products from our suppliers for 25% of our sell price. Okay. So if we're gonna sell it for 20, we try to buy it for $5, including shipping to Amazon, Okay. right? And then from there, you buy it in bulk, so 200, 300 units. You create your own design, your own logo, your mm -hmm. own brand. You try to differentiate it. We have a strategy on how to differentiate products. Mm -hmm. You order a few hundred units, and then your supplier ships directly to Amazon. So all you're doing is online. 
Um, you're not touching the product. You obviously have them send you a sample, mm -hmm. but they ship directly to Amazon. Amazon stores, wow. and then when and you create a listing, all the advertising, when a, a customer orders, Amazon ships. Yeah. And they also do customer service. So when I found that out, I was like, okay, this is scalable. Yeah. I can like go all in on this. And now obviously I'm starting with 150K in debt. And this is another thing that I want to tell your audience and everyone watching mm -hmm. is, like people come to me all the time, I'm broke. I have zero money. You know, I'm a student. I'm like, you know, how much money do you have in the bank? $2,000. I'm like, you are $152,000 richer than I was when I first started. Wow. How did I do it? There is a thing called the OPM. I know you know about it. Um, but unfortunately, people will go and borrow money to buy a house, yeah. which I think is a, a liability. People think it's an asset. That's another argument for another day. They'll go and, and, and borrow money to get a degree that can get them hopefully maybe a job that they can get fired from just like that, mm -hmm. but they won't borrow money to start a business, right? And that's the mind boggling thing to me. Fortunately, although I was raised with a father that said, never borrow money, never partner with people. Fortunately, I was a little wiser and I decided to borrow money. And actually the first money that I borrowed was from my girlfriend's mom, who now is my mother-in-law. Yeah. And this is only six months after dating her daughter, right? Now, I'm Middle Eastern. Yeah. You don't just come around and start dating my daughter, let alone borrow $5,000 from me, Yeah. right? And so... Um, was that a different, was that a culture shock from what you... Oh, 100%. Are you still was asking the mom? Well, I asked the daughter and the daughter asked and the, the daughter mom. Asked yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was like, hey, look, I need five grand to start this thing. She's like, uh, I don't have it. I'm yeah. like, do your parents have it? You know, because I couldn't just go to my mom or dad and ask for money. I mean, I had just, I had, I had completely crashed yeah. that bridge, you know, right, so. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, so I want to um, unpack this idea a little bit because you said Amazon just kind of stuck with you in this show, finding your niche with niche. I sat down and talked to people about how they specifically, like, found their niche, what sure. obstacles and successes did they overcome in order to get to where they are today. Um, what was it about it that you think like, that you thought this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing? I don't know if I knew that that's what I was supposed to be doing. I just knew that I need to do something. Mm -hmm. I was in a situation, I had big dreams, I had big goals, I had given up on for a little while there. I went into depression and I thought, okay, this is fantasy world, this is real world, right? I need to kind of be okay with this. Mm -hmm. And then I got snapped out of it. But honestly, it was a few things for me. It was the first thing, you know, Amazon accounts for over 53% of all online sales. So all the websites in the world, you know, 53% of all online shopping happens on Amazon. So mm -hmm. for, for me, that was a thing. The other thing, I think the stat is like, I can't remember what it was, but I think it was like between 40 to 60% of all active Amazon sellers make like 100K or more per year, mm -hmm. right? I was like, okay, I can get behind that, right. you know? The fact that I could do it online, that was the biggest thing because I was tired of retail, especially hospitality. Yeah. All my life I worked in restaurants. My first job in America at 16, I worked at McDonald's. And then I moved to uh, San Diego, I worked at another McDonald's where my mom and I actually worked at. I was in the front, she was in the back cooking. Wow. Right? Okay. And then, uh, and this is actually something that I, I haven't really talked about very much, I'm not sure why. Um, and then, after that, I worked at a Greek restaurant, which until now, when I go to San Diego, I eat there because it's the best Greek restaurant I've ever eaten at. Greek mm. chicken. If you ever go to San Diego, you have to eat there. Greek, Greek chicken. chicken. Yeah, it's really good. Um, and, then the, and then from there, I rolled into our restaurant. Mm -hmm. And from there, I rolled into my restaurant. And so it was just all restaurants. Right. And I was just hustle sick and, and bustle. tired. You're tired of the hustle and bustle. Yeah, I was. And, and you know, I had spent about seven years in restaurants now. And I was just tired of that environment. It was a toxic environment. I just didn't like it. And I want to do something different. The fact that I could work from home, mm -hmm. anywhere in the world, online, I don't have to be anywhere. I don't have a schedule. You know, I don't, and, at the, and also the other thing is yeah. I had bad credit. So then I just wasn't sure if, you know, if we should like, if I, if I can get in there or whatever it is. And, and Amazon, they don't care. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't care about like if you have a misdemeanor, if you have a felony, whatever. You know? Right. I've got a, we've got a couple of felons in our group, in our community, you know, and like yeah. people that have spent like 10, 15 years in jail. It's like, hey, man, wow. look, no, no, no judgments here. I get it. People make mistakes. That could have been me. You know, one one left turn, one right turn. I mean, shit, I got I got arrested for a DUI. Mm -hmm. There were times where I would get home, wake up in the morning, be like, 
how the hell did I drive my car here? Yeah. This could have been me crashing into someone and killing them, right? Amazon doesn't discriminate, you know? Doesn't matter what color you are, doesn't mm -hmm. matter where you're from, doesn't matter who you are, mm -hmm. you can go right in. So to me, that was a plus, I was yeah. like, great, you know? And just all these things put together, um, I was just like, this just makes sense. Yeah. And I had tried other things, that's the other thing too. Mm -hmm. I had tried affiliate marketing, I had tried, uh, I was following a guy uh, who does like penny stock trading, I don't know if you've heard what that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I had tried doing that. I got it, wholesaling, real estate was like pretty hot now with courses and stuff oh, like yeah, that online. Yeah. So I tried doing that as well. The course was just a little too complicated, I got overwhelmed. Um, what else? I think crypto, I invested like $600 in a, there was this thing called BitConnect. I don't know what it was, it was a coin. Okay. And then like six months later, it turned out to be a scam and I lost my money, okay. you know? So I tried those, you know, a couple yeah. of things. But Amazon, it was just, it seemed legit, all these things put together, you know? And I went for it. Yeah, and, and you have a really interesting philosophy because I talk to a lot of people on the show and they talk about, you know, when you think about finding your niche, essentially the backdrop of that is to find your purpose, find your passion. But your philosophy is a little bit different because you believe in order to find your passion, you have to find the money. Yeah, I say you have fuck to find the fin finances first. Yeah, I say fuck your passion. And here's why. Um, today, I do my passion. And I'm 100% behind it. That's the thing that drives me. But when you're starting, when I was 150K in debt and Gary V would tell me, find your passion, I was like, go fuck yourself. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I have debt collectors calling me every day. I have threat messages coming into my phone every single day. I need to make my dad and my mom proud, right? I'm 23 years old, 25 at the time. I've just met a girl that I think is pretty special and I don't want to lose her. I would literally, we would go out on a date and I would have like $45 in, our, in my pocket, right? Mm -hmm. I gotta make sure that there is enough gas in the car. Yep. We gotta make sure that we go out, eat, hang out, do something in San Diego, 45 bucks. Like how the hell are you trying to do that, you know? And so I was tired of that. If I sat there trying to seek my passion, dude, I'd be on the streets, you know? So for me, it was, I need to figure something out. I need to get my finances straight. After I was able to do that in 2018 is when I found myself resting on my laurels, is when I found myself kicking back, kicking up my feet because, you know, I had like a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank. I was like, life is good. Mm -hmm. I had retired my parents. You know, I had cleared out my debt. Mm -hmm. I, still, I still couldn't apply for a credit card. I actually just got a credit card this year. Wow. Yes, yeah, almost seven years later. Wow. With a business that does multiple eight figures a year. I just literally got my first credit card this year, right? Um, and, you know, that's when I was like, all right. And I found myself in a place where I don't want to grow this anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not passionate about this anymore. And that's when I went seeking for my passion. And luckily, my passion just happened to be right in front of me. I just needed to look at it. Today, that's all I do. And that's mm -hmm. all I'll ever do. Every mm -hmm. time I feel that I'm uninspired doing something, I just kick it off. Mm. Yeah. Why do you think, though, why do you have that philosophy that people should, should worry about getting money before worrying about what they're supposed to be doing in life. Again, just exactly as what I said, because when you have debt collectors calling you every day, like if you wanna be, if you wanna truly find your passion, look, unless you picked up a, 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 a paintbrush when you were like two months old and started painting, or you've got a great voice, or you're just an awesome soccer or football player or whatever, that's different, right? And some people even do it not for the passion, they're just good at it and then they turn out to do something completely different, right? Yeah. But unless you have a great skill, which I obviously don't, like you need to go out seeking for it and you need to really be intentional to find it, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to come from a place of abundance. You cannot come from a place of scarcity. And again, when you have debt, when people are calling you every day asking for their money, you're not in no place of abundance. Mm -hmm. You are scared as shit and you want to like get things done, right? So I wasn't in a place emotionally and mentally, I didn't have the mental capacity to go seeking my passion because I didn't have an obvious sign. So, and I didn't even know what the hell that meant. Mm -hmm. Like again, I would, you know, when I first went online, the one of the loudest people was Grant Cardone, Gary Vee, all these guys. And it was like, you know, Gary Vee's talking about like, find your passion, you know, do something you're passionate about. I'm like, dude, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. There's nothing I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. Me trying to go find my passion right now, I'm like stressed out all day long. How do I find my passion in that state? You just can't. You know, again, unless it's very obvious for you, you can't do it, right? And again, I was 25. I had just experienced 
one of the most tragic things. Mm -hmm. It's not like I was, I had a job, because it's also different. If you say have a job and you've been in a job stuck for 10 years, but you know, you're like, like you've made things work out, you know, like yeah. it's worked out, you know? Yeah, you can spend another six months looking for your passion. But when you just had a, a massive life changing experience mm -hmm. and you're in like, you know, your back is against the wall, it's like, dude, I gotta figure something out. I don't know about the whole passion thing, mm -hmm. you know? But there's a, a, a line that needs to be drawn in the sand. Once you have made it to the other side, you must find your passion because if you don't, you will get fucked. You will literally just blow everything off because mm -hmm. I nearly blew everything because mm -hmm. I found myself on the beach in San Diego, again, drunk at a bar again, when I wasn't supposed to be driving. Well, I, luckily I wasn't driving. I had a friend that was driving me, mm -hmm. um, but I had made it in my sense at that time. Yeah. I mean, this is the first time I'm making like, I don't know, maybe like 20 grand a month in profits. Mm. Holy shit. Yeah. This kind of money's even real. Like, I didn't even know something like that existed, Yeah. right? I could literally walk in anywhere, get anything I wanted at any time, right? Now I couldn't walk in and, and to Gulfstream and get a private jet, but hey, you know, who cares, mm -hmm. right? But I was doing a lot better than the average person that was, you know, around sure, me and, sure. and a lot better, right? And so that's when I realized that, okay, I need to, like, what is this? I don't see myself doing this for the rest of my life. I need to find something where I could see myself and plan 20 years from now. Mm. Okay, so you believe that people cannot really find their passion until they get on the other side of financial freedom. I do believe so, yeah. You have to, again, you have to come from a place of abundance and you can't come from a place of scarcity. Mm, that's good. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit because I think this is a, an extremely important part to success and possibly to your success, but the mental shifts that you had to do in order to become who you are today. Because I've even seen like some, some of the pictures that you pose in videos, you almost look like a different person. Mm. Like you almost are, are, are new. Okay. And so can you talk about the work that you had to do or the work that others imparted into you in order for you to become mentally different and, men and have the mental capacity to handle the level of success? So there is, there's a couple of things. The first thing is, this whole idea of, of think big. I know it's very cliche, it's very mm -hmm. simple, mm -hmm. but it's very important for you to surround yourself with the right people. So I was, this is 2020 now. Um, in 2018, late 2018, I was hanging out with my uh, uh, wife's cousin who I actually had a conversation with last night. And he asked me this question, and now I ask almost everybody that I meet this question. And actually, I, I was meaning to ask her this earlier before okay. we started. Where do you see yourself in the next three to five years? He asked me that question, and it changed my life. And because I know the impact that it made on me, I now ask it to every person. And 90% of people that I ask them, they have no freaking clue. Mm. Oh, I just don't plan that far. I just don't think like that. Oh, I don't know. You know, I, honestly, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I know in six months, but when you think that far ahead... yeah is when it made, makes that shift in your mind, right? So for me, when I thought of three to five years, I stared at him in the face. I was like, dude, I have no idea. He's like, wait, I thought you were like really happy with what you're doing. I'm like, I am, but I don't see myself doing this continuously and growing it for the next three to five years. Because again, I was rested. I was doing okay. Yeah. Everyone around me, to them, I was like, God, I had made it, you know? Yeah, yeah. My mom was starting to feel pretty proud of me now. You know, mm -hmm. my dad was definitely proud of me. And, and that's when I started BJK University, mm -hmm. which is our company right now, which is my main focus, which is teaching people how to, you know, we're an education company. We teach people how to start online businesses. Currently, we're focused on Amazon, but the plan is to go into other horizontals, such as, you know, a trading or a crypto or whatever else. But sure. we, we're a university where people come to us to acquire a skill, they can turn into income within 90 days or less. And then the plan is also to launch um, other programs where, where they, uh, can, they can tackle like kind of like seminars. It's all good? Good? Okay. Okay. Holy shit, we've been on for almost an hour? God damn, I talk a lot. Okay. <laughs> And then so, you know, the plan is to also kind of add other aspects of their lives or, or, or uh, um, I guess, approach their other life uh, um, 
aspects, which is like their emotional life, their relationships, their, mm -hmm. their mindset, all that stuff. Because I know that's where I made the biggest, uh, uh, um, you know, the biggest development and what, yeah. drew, what drove me to achieve the financial success, mm -hmm. right? So when I realized that, I, I understood that, you know, in order for me to succeed, I needed to work on my mindset. Mm -hmm. But it all first starts to what you're aware of, what you're exposed to, right? And awareness comes from your surrounding. So in 2020, our business was staggering. We were at the same level for the whole year, and I was just comfortable. So what I did is I removed myself from that environment, mm -hmm. and I moved from San Diego to, to Miami, a place where I knew nobody, a mm -hmm. place where I had never been. And it was a completely new environment for me, and it put me out of my comfort zone. Sure. So it's continually challenging myself, continually investing in education because it's awareness. People, anyone watching, they're probably right here. And obviously this is different for every person. But in order for you to go from here to here, there is only one thing that's holding you. And that's level of awareness, right? And the only way you can gain that level of awareness is exposure. Exposing yourself to books, exposing yourself to podcasts like this one, exposing yourself to Coaches, this year alone, we've invested nearly $600,000 in coaching, mastermind, and, and consulting. Wow. Because I know how much of a return it's brought into my life and how much it can bring into my life. Mm. So it's continuously investing. People hear me say that and they're like, dude, but I don't have 600K to invest. I'm like, yeah, my first course was 500 bucks, right? You can't compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 20. Sure. You know, people look at Elon Musk and say, well, he's running seven companies. Yeah, but he didn't start running seven companies, right? He did that when he was worth like $200, $300 million. Mm. And so it's about continuously pushing yourself, continuously putting yourself in new environments, and continuously exposing yourself to new information. And when you do that, you start gaining new perspectives. And so it was, that was the very first thing. And then it went more tactical, right? It went... So that was kind of like overall Him. motivation. Okay. And even earlier than that was Rocky Balboa, honestly. Hmm. Until now, I have a, a little metal thing that I have on my, uh, on my uh, whiteboard. It's a quote by him. So, you know, Rocky Balboa, yeah. uh, the movie, uh, yeah. Sylvester Stallone, he's one of my, not one of, he's my favorite actor. And uh, he's got a quote. He says, uh, it's not about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done, right? Um, so it was... Just all those combined together and then going more tactical, like, okay, Amazon FBA, take a course. Mm -hmm. um, I want to learn about PPC, hiring a coach that teaches me about PPC. And again, it also came because I had the experience of doing it all by myself, thinking I know it all. I mean, before I started my, my restaurant business, I watched reality TV show Bar Rescue by John Taffer for six months, taking notes, mm. thinking now I'm an expert at running a restaurant from watching reality show right? And so I realized that in order for me to, to become successful and to keep growing, I need professional help. And so from there, it was more tactical. When I went to growing my consulting business, it was Sam Ovens, became one of his students, and then kind of grew from there. And then now it's people like Dean Graziosi, Dan Locke, Ty Lopez, you know, Gary Vee, all these people trying to get like one-on-one -on -one time with them, mm -hmm. where I can sit for one hour, you know, literally summarize everything in one hour, mm -hmm and then implemented my business. Mm -hmm. We need to build a finance department. Okay, who's the best you know, uh, uh, fractional CFO? Let's go hire him, bring him, teach us. We need to bring wow. this thing. Who's the best at this? Go bring them, you know, hire them to, to teach us, and then so on. Wow. Okay, and but as we get ready to close, best piece of advice you can give to somebody who might be stuck in a rut and want to see themselves where you are? So this is going to contradict what I said earlier, but it's not. So hear me out. If you're wanting to start a business or if you want to, and it's not even a business, you don't need to start your own thing for you to make it in life. You can work for someone else. I, I was very close to working for someone else and I would have done very well as well. But it's very important for you to start with your why, right? And this is not your passion. It's completely different. Hmm. You need to be clear on your why. And my why for me when I was starting out is, I was very strong. I need to retire my parents I need to gain the respect of my dad back. I need to clear the $150,000 in debt. And I need to be able to marry the love of my life. And to me, that was strong enough to wake me up every single day, regardless what life was throwing at me. I was still willing, even if I did not feel good, I was still willing to go through walls and make it on the other side because my why was big enough. Again, that's not passion, 
This has nothing to do with passion. This is just being clear on your why. Because turbulence will happen, because bad things will happen. Life is not perfect. Life is a bitch. And trust me, it will test you in every single way you want it to do it. Right? So you got to be clear on your why before you start anything. Otherwise, no point in even starting. Mm, that's good. Um, I know one of your whys right now, too, is to impact one million lives. Yes. How close are you to that goal? We're nowhere near. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the plan is by 2026, we want to be there. Okay. Yeah. Well, there it is. In 2026, I'm going to call you. Yes. Absolutely. See. I want you to hold me accountable. Sure. Richard, <laughs> thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate for it. For sitting and talking with me. Um, if people want to learn about the university and how to be a part of what you're doing, how can they do that? So just go to Instagram, uh, BesharJK2 on Instagram, um, and you can watch all about you know, the content that we post. You can watch about everything that we do. You can check out some of our student case studies and really learn just a little bit more about what we do and who I am and what the university is about. There it is. All right. Thanks, y'all. Peace.